I don't have a producer or an engineer telling me to do it again. I can sing until I get sore and then I can go drink some coffee. Then <laughs> I come back and sing a little bit more the next day. You know, I don't have to blow my voice out. Ghost Cold Magazine welcomes in Christopher Hall of Stabbing Westward. How are you today, Christopher? I'm good. I was trying to get rid of the little lady on my phone. I'm, I'm all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Good, good. I'm, I'm, if, I, if I wince a bit, I apologize. Yes, Every yes. Every time I move a certain way, it's like a little... Uh, yeah. You mentioned, you mentioned, uh, we'll rest up and heal up soon. Thank uh, you. This is an exciting time. We are on the, the cusp of a brand new record. We talked just last year about how exciting this was and we didn't know all the full details. And then after we spoke, we got the single, I Am Nothing. But Chasing Ghost is coming out on the great Cop International label very soon, a few weeks. And um, just super pumped. As you knew, I was last year super pumped about new Stabbing Westward music. I just looked behind me and saw my email sitting up. <laughs> yeah, I don't think people are going to like zoom and enhance on your emails, but probably, yeah, for the best. I, def I definitely did like an entire interview with somebody not too long ago and they had like all their stems for their new album up behind me. And I was like, I don't know what, <laughs> yeah, I don't know, you know, do with that what you will. Doing a remix right now. There you go. Oh, yeah. uh, we're, we're all about it. We love the remixes, man. Yeah, we yeah, love yeah. them. We love them. So yeah, man, that's very exciting. Congratulations. I'm totally Thanks. digging this record. It's a very logical next stabbing record to me. Oh, so you, you've heard the whole thing? I've heard the whole thing multiple times. Cool, and actually, cool. while I was waiting for you to jump on, I was jamming it again. <laughs> right, I was right. like, oh, he's going to take a few more minutes. Let's blast it again. Let's go. I'm like, I got to go. I got to go. I got to go. Oh, uh, no, it's okay. I mean, like, you know, these things happen and uh, interviews run over and it's happened to me. You get to get in the zone. And, uh, you know, sometimes you're like, oh, what's the time? Whoops. Um, yep. <laughs> you're, not, you're not trying to do this on purpose. And your PRs are, PR team's amazing. So we never want to run. We don't want to befoul them, but uh, they're awesome. So yeah, man, congrats on this record. And what I thought we would do since we just chatted last year, all about the history of the band and a lot of you were you uh, you know you were so kind and unveiled such a, a bunch of nuggets of stuff of wisdom that we just never knew about. At least I never knew about. Um, I didn't want to repeat myself. So I thought what would be fun is if we go through the track listing and you just share any impressions you have about the album, uh, okay. song by song, and we'll blast through it. It might give you back your day sooner than later. So uh, Chasing Ghosts, uh, the the single, the epic single starts the album, I Am Nothing. Is I yes. Nothing the first, is that the first song? It is. Oh, that's it pretty is the, cool. I didn't know that was the opener. That's very cool. <laughs> With that bomb, 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 bomb. Um, yeah, so that's that's one of my tracks. And um, the the when I when I did that track, I had, I had listened to the demos for the whole record and felt like we were lacking in... Um, that classic stabbing westward, heavy, halftime, on your way down, everything I touch, I don't believe, those those heavy kind of halftime feeling songs. And so um, I'd had that vocal idea bouncing around for about two years. And I was like, I got to find some music to put on this. And um, once I went down that path, I just kind of like channeled my inner Andy, which is the old drummer from, from stabbing. It, it, it all just came together. It was so cool. That was a really fun track to do. Definitely. I will single out that uh, when we had talked last and you said like, oh, I'm singing better than I ever have in my life. And I, we were talking about the Dead and Gone EP and I was like, oh, yeah, man, I hear it. And then on this record, I'm going to say like right from the jump of this first song that we were given, your voice is just ridiculously amazing on this record, man. I can't Thanks. gush enough about how yeah. fantastic you sound. John, John did a really good job taking the vocals that I did in my bedroom here and turning them into what sounded like we did it at a real studio. <laughs> so he did a great job. Yeah, John Fryer, the amazing. John we'll Fryer, just, yeah. We call him the wizard. Uh, the legend, yeah. <laughs> the legend, he sure is. And he is he is the house uh, producer, at least for the next little while, for Cop International, similar to his time with 4AD, a phenomenal. Yeah, exactly. I think, I think that's a great idea, too, having, because his run at 4AD was so amazing. I mean, that was one of the most important labels to me as an artist when I was a kid and um, with like Dead Can Dance and Cocteau Twins and Smortal Coil. Um, and, and the fact that he kept the whole thing cohesive, the whole, not just each band, but the whole label had a sound, you know, that was cool. I think, I think Christian made a really smart call giving John as mm. a house producer. Fantastic. I agree. Damaged Goods is track number two on the record. It's an apology to my wife. 
that one is yeah it's pretty much what that song is oh have <laughs> so, heavy yeah it's just like sorry you know i, I know that you thought i was going to be a project but uh <laughs> yeah that's that's a fun one because i named that one after um there's a gang of four song damaged goods which is one of my favorite songs and so i liked the idea of playing off the title of that one nice and rest in peace andy gill who was a terrible oh, terrible yeah. loss what a bummer yeah we lost so many over the last few years andy that's a rough one i actually think one of my favorite lyrics on the record is from damaged goods um, um i was broken when you met me and entropy is carried on from there i like dropping the word entropy into <laughs> a track get my, my physics nerd on you know there you go that's a good one not to mention uh the the flow of the phonetics is always a good one on that one you have multiple syllables so you can, you can work it into a, a rhyme scheme uh the third track is cold yeah so that one was one of the ones that was on the original ep and so right. so the the goal was to um not just have john mix it but to try and present it in a slightly different way so that it didn't feel rehashed um and and john's john's comment to me was lead singers of industrial bands don't play trumpet on stage so he got the whole trumpet intro out. he's like what is that i don't even understand what that is it's like it's a song about being cold yet i picture you wearing like robes standing on a sand dune like why does it feel like that so um yeah he he, he made a, a pr production decision there which is cool and uh then i i think he really like punched the song up quite a bit quite the dance track now yes definitely and all the tracks that were previously released definitely sound sonically you know improved oh, yeah. altered changed updated so if you've if you were excited and eager to get that ep which was a surprise drop i think and if I, my, I recollect correctly, and uh, I think it, it, you'd be pleasantly surprised on the full new album, how those yeah. songs have a, a bit of new life, all of them. Push is the next track I, I have in my notes. It was like the droney long one. <laughs> okay, so so on the version of the record you got, is is Push like seven minutes long? Yes, 729. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. um, cool. I wasn't sure if it, if it made the cut, because there's a, there a short version and a long version. Ooh. And um, the short version was uh, none of the melodies that come in at the intro and stuff were there. It was just kind of like came out the bass line, keyboard melody, and then just, it was like a single version. And then um, during COVID, uh, I was walking my, like doing really long walks with my dog. And uh, for some reason, Spotify was reading my mood and kept playing songs off uh, The Cure Disintegration and songs like uh the same deep water um tracks like that would play where it would take two minutes for the vocals to come in and um i'd be i'd be walking it was like gray winter time not cold when we we're down to the beach but it's still gray kind of chilly wearing a hoodie and um those songs would come on and it just seemed and, and the world was empty it was like no cars everyone's hiding in their house um and it just it just felt like it captured the mood of the world so well. And I thought, you know, we used to write songs like that. Waking Up Beside You is a song like that. And it's one of people's favorite songs. Why do we keep making our songs shorter and shorter and tighter and tighter and like, get you the point, you know? Um, so I, w I went home and um, over the course of a couple of months, just noodled around on my keyboards and tried to come up with uh, little phrases and little guitar parts that would help the song kind of build. I I, I haven't heard, yeah, I, I have heard that one. Um, I liked the seven minute version. Though. To me, it felt like a journey and I'm, I'm glad it made the cut. Yeah, I they're gonna put a short version on it, yeah, cool. Oh, I, I love to hear the short version, but I will say the long version, I love where it is in the album. It definitely breaks the album up into like, here's a little bit and then this other part and then here's the rest. And I like that kind of flow. And I feel like cool. sequencing, Album sequencing is a little bit of a lost art to me because people are very singles and EP focused today. Yeah, Walter did the sequencing for the record, and um, mm. and um, he's a he's a music programmer. That's what he does. He like programs, right, you know, it's, he literally sequences what you hear on the radio at, 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 in, when you're in your car. And so um, he's 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 got the skills for it. He knew what he was doing. That's your playlist guy at the party, everybody. Walter. Yep, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and, and your setlist live. He comes up with the setlist live. Nice work. Yeah, I think you mentioned that last time we chatted that he was you know, kind of at this point doing the set list. Uh, one of my favorite tracks on the record for sure 
is Wasteland. And that is the next one after Push, which is a very good to follow up to Push, right? If you have this very right. one one mood and then right into another. Yeah, that was my, that was a, that was a COVID song. That was kind of right when everything was, was happening. I was writing that. So the world's gone mad and all around me are desperate people desperately trying to survive, fighting to survive, right? Um, mm -hmm. That's all, all I wanted was a roll of toilet paper. That was like, I was literally like writing a song about toilet paper. But um, yeah, that, that was fun. Um, I was I was listening to a lot of Gary Newman, um, his, uh, the, the record with My Name is Ruin on it is like, is like such a dystopian, it's like a beautiful dystopian nightmare record. Like every song is like, you know, it could be the theme song from the Matrix or something like that. And it, it was, I was, I was listening to a lot of that. So I wanted to try to channel some of that dystopian feel while still sounding like Stabbing Westwood. So. Oh, and the vocal melody sounds like why, or no, like uh, You Complete Me. Mm. I realized that at one point. I was like, oh, I, I've written this song before. <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. I've heard that before. Uh, Gary's on tour here in the States right now. So everybody. Yeah, should... my friend saw him in Texas the other day. Go see him because he's yeah, a legend amazing live show too so good yeah and we all got so much from him just literally he invented all this stuff like 40 he plus did years all the, all the music that we we do everything we do he's the one that made it cool to do it you know he is. cars hey, oh so, so much so much uh control z follows wasteland at number six um i don't actually know what this one sounds like this is one of the ones i haven't heard um, there were at one point three versions of this song mm. floating around three completely different versions of the song. I had a version, Carlton did like a crazy industrial remix version. And then Walter one weekend just wrote a bunch of music to it, put the vocal on. And that was, I think the deemed official, official version of the song. So, um, I don't even know what chorus we're using because there's three different choruses. <laughs> I'm not sure, but I like the idea of Control Z being the un undo button on on a PC. Sorry, Mac people. Yes, whoever thought that up is a genius because it is the yeah. most convenient thing possible. We're all gonna have like a little carpal tunnel in yeah, our life. Sure. <laughs> redo, redo, redo. Um, crawl is next. Crawl. So crawl was one of the songs on the EP. It was originally a waltz with a music box. Mm. Um, the, the the version on the on the EP um, and that was uh, that was one of my pieces of music that I did and then um, when we talked about putting it on the album I'm like you can't just do it the same way I sent it to John actually to mix and John's like it feels like a waltz I don't know what to do with it I'm not sure you know how do I make this a, a, a tough rock song I'm like you don't you keep it a very gentle music he's like it doesn't fit the record you need to figure something out. And so um, I kept coming back to the fact that he said it was a waltz, which is in three, four. And um, I thought, well, what if I try putting the music in four, four? What would happen? Like a standard, you know, song. And um, it's 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 a bit of a it's a bit of a head fuck to like <laughs> have something that's so ingrained in your brain and then try and sing it against a different beat. But I would walk my dog and I would stomp like I'm marching. And then try and sing the song while I'm stomping and break out of the three four. And um, on day two of trying it, I found the the pattern that I was looking for. It's like a Rubik's cube where you're trying to like break the code. And I figured it out. And I ran home, and I I, I put a drum machine down. And then I just basically spoke the words over the drum machine in the right rhythm. And then once I heard it, then it made sense. And then I could listen back to it. And then if I like later that day I forgot it, I'm like I can't remember what I did went back and listened and it's like, oh, okay, then it made sense. And then I sent that to Walter and Walter built an entire track around it. And uh, I've never heard it since. But yeah, it's, it's, if, you, if, you, if you're complaining that some of the songs I already have are on the new album, this is a brand new song. This is completely, completely different. Again, so I'll say it again and dead, dead, dead and gone or dead underscore gone now is also next and is also sonically almost sounds like a whole different track. Except yeah, John, John really lifted this one up for sure, um, which is, which is, you know, you can hear you know, on this track, you can hear the difference between us mixing and John, <laughs> like just A, B, the two of them. And it's like, I don't think anything really changed 
all that much musically, but John just brought like life to it, just like made it feel like a band was playing it, which is very cool. Guy's gifted. What can you say? He's got the gift. Ghost is is the next to last track. Yeah, I, I fought against that. I thought that Ghost should have been earlier in the record. Um, I was like, put that towards the front. I think that's one of the better songs. Walter disagreed. And then Christian chose it as a second single. Like, I told you, I told you. But now people have to wait for the whole record to listen to it because you can't just, you know, play one song. You have to listen to the entire album. It's like a law, right? Um, Ghost is cool. Um, the, the funny thing about Ghost was... Um, the, the morning it came out as a single, my phone blew up. People started texting me, are you okay? Like, Why, <laughs> what happened? And I'm like, what's, why are all these people asking me this? I'm like, what's going on? And I'm like, why are you asking? I'm fine. Was there an earthquake or something? Like, what, what is it everyone's really about? Oh, we heard Jimmy's song. I'm like, oh, cool. I'm like, are you okay? I'm like, I'm f oh, I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. Yeah, yeah. I realized maybe I put a little too much on the table with that one. <laughs> Well, you know, that's uh that's been one of your trademarks. You've thrown it all out there for us for, you know, it's 30 my years. Job, man. <laughs> um I, I do I do hope you're okay. Ghost is definitely one of my favorite tracks also. And uh, I just it's got that just it's just classic stabbing. If you love this band, you will you will love mo you know the yeah, it uh, has, the, yeah. It, it has an authenticity to it that that um is like I, I think every, you get like two or three songs on record if you're lucky. That have that sort of authentic feel to it. It does kind of have that to me, where it's just like you can tell it's real. You can tell it's like so. right on. And then I and then the final track is the end. And my notes said that when I first saw the track listing, I was like, is this a Doors cover? No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, no. So there was a song called The End, right? Yeah. Yeah. And there was a song called Wasteland by The Mission, and there was a song called Damaged Goods by Gang of Four. So I think we mm. copied a lot of. Um, no, The End was actually written. Um, for the self-titled album back in 2001. Walter and I had written it for that album and um, it was deemed too dark, which uh, it, it was too dark for that record. Um, but um, when we were when we were talking about putting a record together, um, you know, he's like, this has always been one of my favorite tracks and I'd forgotten about it. I'd actually taken the vocal melody and some of the words and written a new song after the band broke up. So I'm like, well, this is a cool, you know vocalize it and so i wrote a song called fly away um that came after the end and then when he pulled up the cassette demo at the end it was literally cassette and um played it for me like oh my god i remember this this is where fly away came from and um and we we tried to like I tr we tried to modernize it a little bit and i tried to like rewrite the lyrics and do stuff to it and then i realized now there's something really pure about the version that we did in 2001. It was like, like we knew that the end of the band was, was nearby and, and we captured that sort of weird feeling. And so I, I went back and listened to the cassette and re-sang it as close to the original as I could. Wow, that's awesome. And yeah. uh, it's pretty, that's another pretty heavy one. Uh, I'm <laughs> yeah, it's very heavy. I'm, I'm glad it made it to, you know, made it to the album. And uh, I was going to say, with the exception of this track, and you just gave us the backstory, you live with most of these songs for the last few years. Now that we're sort of on the cusp of the album and you have a sense, except for the one track, how it's all going to kind of flow and, you know, where it landed, how are you feeling about it? Because when we first talked a few years back, you know, for the first time in a while, you were like, oh, you know, I'm really excited and we, gotta, we can't tell you everything, but like, you know, just... You know the excitement was high but some of this stuff obviously hadn't been developed or fleshed out yet and now that we're here how, how is it feeling for you uh, ready to come out almost it's a little weird for me because i felt kind of detached from the process because of covid and because of the way the whole thing worked out um but it's it's always great to have when you have ideas that are like they're like your babies like you have this little thought in your brain the tiny little seed of an idea and then you turn it into a chorus and then you play with it for six months and then you turn it into a, add some verses to it and then to have it actually be born into a song that's like then released you know to the world I the call go away spam um then that's that's a really really cool cool feeling it's like you know but it's also like <clears throat> sending your kid to college it's like you were my baby but now I'm giving you to all these other people and, and you're going to become something to them you know so now 
our music exists in the ears of the people who listen to it and in the hearts of the people that that feel it not <clears throat> not necessarily with us anymore it's out of our hands which is cool right as if as much as so i imagine that like the stress anxiety how is it going to be received but also the freedom like we made it you know it's done finally and like it this is yeah other than remixes this is kind of it <clears throat> Yeah, I don't care anymore. I used to get really stressed out about that kind of stuff, but um, I'm not on social media anymore, so I don't care. No one can. <laughs> if if you don't like my record, cool, that's cool. But yeah, when I was on when I was on Facebook and MySpace and and stuff like that, I couldn't believe, um, like the things that people would say to us about our songs or about you know what I mean. Like like they would just. They felt like it was okay to come on our page and say really, really, really mean. <laughs> I know I sound like Taylor Swift, but it's like I would never walk up to Robert Smith and 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 say some of the things that people have have said to us, um, or, or not just us. I'm sure to millions of other artists. It's like I think being given access to uh, bands in that way have, have made people sort of um, not brought brought out the best in people. So once I got off social media um none of that stuff really mattered anymore because if, if 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 as an artist you read that stuff and you took it to heart it could you know it could really it could really like uh affect the way that you write if 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 enough people have act, actually it did so um after the dead and gone ep came out i was reading comments about the the songs in I think it was in band camp or whatever. And one of the themes <clears throat> that kept popping up over and over again was this doesn't sound like Stabbing Westwood. This sounds like the dreaming. This sounds like the dreaming. This sounds like Chris's other band. And um that opinion, which it, it was, you know, probably less than one percent, but you only see the negatives when you read comments. And so those negatives kind of got in my head. And and at one point I'm like, I want to make sure, Walter, that you do the production on on as much of this record as possible so that it doesn't become contaminated with the dreaming and then i realized later like wow so that's me so basically i had to like remove myself from the production of the record because anything i do sounds too much like me which is my other band and i'm like how did i let these people get into my brain like that is yeah. so and that's, that's unfortunate kind of that's unfortunate because first of all, the dreaming rules and people love the dreaming, but also when the dreaming came out, you made a point to be like, this is not stabbing. This is m me and myself. And this is my vision and from my brain and my soul. And people were like, oh, it's not stabbing, but it's still Chris. And so it's weird that now, like years later, you know, we can all get infected by this stuff. We get our share of negative shitty comments you should see my youtube unpublished list is humongous and terrible uh alternately about the artists somewhat about me like personal attacks on me i'm too woke i'm too chubby i'm too cool with my battle vest sometimes i don't know <laughs> like you can't please everybody you gotta just please you and be who you are and i think a lot of people have loved this band because you are who you are walter is who he is other members and um you know we it's a very you know you talk about relatable stuff and i don't want you to change that but on the other hand you know, it's interesting if it if it had a positive effect on the final outcome of the record, cool. But also, never read the comments. That's my advice. And I yeah, wouldn't. never read the comments. Never read I, the I, comments. I, I do think that it had. Um, I, I do think it had a positive effect because I, I think that the the history of the band, um, when you think of the songs that people love, uh, shame, waking up beside you, save yourself, violent mood swings. Um, those are all Walter writing the music and me writing the vocals. I mean, what do I have to do? Sometimes it hurts haunting me was Andy writing the music and me doing the vocals. But um, a, a huge chunk of the band was, was Walter music, me vocals. That's kind of how people identify the band. And I just needed to take myself out of it a little bit, like step back. Yes, I've worked really hard the last 20 years to become a songwriter. And I got to demonstrate that on a handful of songs. But just remove my ego from it, remove you know that and and be that magic chemistry one, one of the things that made me realize is that for the last 20 years i've been searching for band members in los angeles home of millions of musicians everyone who wants to be somebody comes here and of all the musicians i've played with in the dreaming i found one guy carlton who i actually wanted to, to, to write music with everyone else came and went 
uh, very talented, all went to bigger bands, did their thing. I never connected with them. And when, when Walter and I got back together to, re to reform Stabbing Westward, I realized that the guy that I met at summer music camp in 1982, just nerdy dude, another nerdy dude fighting over a flute player. We, we became friends and we started a band. That guy, that random dude who lived 30 miles from my house became my musical soulmate. He became the guy that when we write music, we understand exactly what the other person is saying. And it was, it's, it's always just like click. It's like two Legos, you know, hope that doesn't sound, you know, but um, yeah, it's just, it's just a, a bizarre miracle that that happened. And it happened so early you know, in my life and that we managed to somehow stay friends through so many bizarre bad times. And like, you know, high school kids and college kids just are so cruel to each other. And somehow we, we managed to stay friends and um, make music together. And I just think that's a miracle. It's very, very cool. Lucky for you guys and lucky for all of us, I have to say. Yeah. Um, I'm thankful for this band. It has meant a lot to me, as you know. I think a little, most of this album is bangers. I would love to hear a lot of this stuff live. I know you have some plans announced and probably some not announced, but uh, how will you mix in some of these songs into the, you know, such a thick live set? You guys always play, you know, yeah. many songs been, live. Yeah, we've been talking a lot about it. When, when, when it was the 90s, and you had a new album out, you, you basically played the whole new album and then your hits from the previous albums, except for like on our first album, we just played the whole album. And like, that was it. We didn't have any hits yet. So we just played on God. Um, but with each subsequent album that would come out, we played fewer of the older songs and play the whole new album. Um, I don't, we're not gonna do that. <laughs> on this one where i think uh i think we're gonna stick to the songs that people want to hear which is good because that's why they come listening to a whole new album is hard when i go see a band um unless i've pounded the new album into my head um i don't want to hear the whole thing i just want to hear a couple you know the songs off the radio or whatever so uh we're gonna do um i we're gonna try and do i am nothing and ghost for the show in april um we all live in different towns so it's gonna be everyone's gonna have to sit down and listen to them on their own yeah and then and then we'll just sort of see you know what people respond to like um as far as the record if there's songs that people you know kind of kind of gravitate to or they get more plays than other songs whatever then maybe we'll add that. i would really love to play push live i think that would be a really epic kind of song um to play live uh yeah but yeah i mean it, it would be fun to play the record live but i don't think we'll ever do that to be honest just rehearsal time. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll find out. We'll find out. Hopefully yeah, we'll opportunities. I would love for opportunities to happen for y'all where you can come out and do a huge tour and a huge headline tour and get to play some more of these things over time. But who knows? Uh, I would ask that uh, I know what you mentioned about feeling disconnected and doing everything at your home studio. In a perfect world, it's hard to say, but hopefully we're, you know, I'm continue to, I think I've said this in all three of our recent interviews, I'm cautiously optimistic we're gonna get through this thing for the third time, and we're still getting through this thing slowly. In a perfect world, do you think your personal experience and in general, the industry, we're gonna go back into making records in the studio again, or do you think this is probably where it's gonna be in the future? This this is it for us. I mean, I'm, I make records. I have, yes. I have many, many, things to make records with over here. Um, mm. This is this is where I work. This is where I mix other people's records. Um, I'm mixing a record for the band The Hunger from Houston, Texas right now. Remixing a song for a band Amulet from uh, Washington DC area. Um, so I do all my music here. Um, Walter's in Chicago. So um, yeah, he's got, he's got a huge, he's got a Frankenstein's lab over there of stuff that he does. So yeah, this will this will be it for us. I don't think we'll ever go back in a real studio. I've got everything I everything a studio would have. I have, um, you know, I have an SSL console and good compressors and a Neumann mic, and so I'm I'm set. And plus, I don't have I don't have a producer or an engineer telling me to do it again. I can sing until I get sore, and then I can go drink some coffee. Let <laughs> me come back and sing a little bit more the next day. You know, I don't have to blow my voice out. Um, and it's free. I mean, that's the other thing is that we, it wasn't free to build the studio, but it's free to record here. So we can, we can do a record without the investment of 50 or a hundred thousand dollars, which is what it costs to go to a real studio. So for us, at least 
this is it. I, I know that there's the studios were struggling in LA for a while to get business, but there's still enough Adele's and big bands to to keep the big studios busy. But yeah, I'm I'm super happy doing it like this. The only thing I miss is being in a room with with a couple of other guys and bouncing ideas off of each other. I'll sit here and have two competing ideas and just not know like just like just hit a roadblock like these are both good ideas i don't know which one's better and then i'll i'll send them to somebody and go what do you think and then they'll tell me the one i don't want to hear and i'll get mad oh, i want you to pick the other ones <laughs> you know and so that that's the only frustrating thing i think when when walter and i wrote in the same studio back in the, the ungod or the darkest days and the self-titled record he had a studio in his garage in the valley here in la and um, I basically slept on the free time. We would work all day, all night. I would sleep. And then um, we were able to like, you know, I would lean over his shoulder, like, oh, what if you did this? What if you did that? And then he would make it all happen. Um, and I think that was cool because we, we got to really, really play off each other's ideas. And now it's like, he'll, he'll do a whole track in his studio. And he'll do like, like when he did Ghost, I sent him the, the, a rough a rough demo of Ghost, and he did all the music to the entire song over a weekend. And at the end of the weekend, it was done, like in his mind, and it was great. I mean, it's pretty much sounds exactly like the album, but there's some nitpicky things that I'd have been like, oh, what if we what if we tried this year? What if we tried this year? You know, and I never got that opportunity to do it. And 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 by the time it emerged from his cave it was um it wasn't a sketch it was mount rushmore it was carved in stone this is it this is the song and so yeah um that's that's the only downside to not being in a studio it makes and a lot of sense coffee's better <laughs> well at your house for sure you know it definitely makes sense it's it's weird we're living in a new age just kind of for a final thought here uh you know i thought that uh cop again what a wonderful Endeavor and label, they're, they've done a wonderful job, not just that the artwork is amazing you guys put together, but the packaging. And I I think other than reissues, this might be the first stabbing to come out on vinyl, even in a limited run, right when the record is out. So I don't know if you had any feelings about that as we no, grew up on, as on, vinyl people. On God came out on vinyl. Oh, did it? Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. I had one for a while. Um, I was carrying it from apartment to apartment for 25 years. Um, yeah, no, I love vinyl. Um, I've got a big stack of vinyl over here. Yeah, I, I, I love vinyl. And I, I think that's what makes Cop cool is that he's not just trying to um, put out, you know, 89 cent CDs for $12 because who really needs a CD, you know, when you've got the internet or whatever. I think he's trying to put together artwork, packaging, something, you know, that you could keep and collect and, and 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 you know look at the way that we used to you know get really stoned and put on a Pink Floyd record and then look at the artwork and you know go through the liner notes and stuff like that. You know, that was that was kind of the joy of it man, we did back in the the nineteen hundreds. I still do like it's the nineteen hundreds. Yeah. I still do. Yep, yep. Christopher, man, you are always really kind and generous to me and other members of our team. And I really deeply appreciate you. I don't get to talk multiple times to the same artist, but it's always fresh with you. And, I, and I'm just grateful. Thank you so much. Thank you okay. for this record. Chasing Ghosts coming out soon on COP International. We'll see you soon. Okay. Thanks.